Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Mark was suggesting, I, I work at AT&T. Uh, I suppose you were probably expecting uh, Locutus of Borg or uh, Grand Moff Tarkin or the like, accompanied by the Imperial March. Uh, at least some sort of suit with the big, big old telco kind of uh, mentality, uh, with dubious intent and uh, uh, well, hopefully, hopefully I'll disappoint you that way. Anyways, so AT&T, when I first arrived as a part of an acquisition, um, I was very surprised to find that open source was pretty much forbidden. It was not, we're not allowed to use it. It was only used in very small places. And I applaud the efforts of those folks that uh, continued to, you know, carry the flame of open source uh, folks like Stephen North on GraphViz and the people that worked on R during this period of time, they kept that flame alive. It was surprising to me, given the history of AT&T and our involvement in Unix and C, kind of the, the integral pieces of everything that we do, uh, and especially Dennis Ritchie's contribution to sharing, giving the tapes of Unix away to other companies. This was a seminal moment in the beginning of forming, formation of open source. I've always felt as, a, uh, as part of AT&T that I could help make this change happen, given that I've uh, been a part of at least a user and abuser of open source for a very long time. I felt like I could bring that notion into AT&T. AT&T now is just changed its thinking. Today, it's a much different place when it comes to thinking about open source. And it is now an integral part of our strategy. We are uh, active participants, not only in OpenStack, but in other projects. And we're now looking at expanding that into an, a new area that I'll talk about today. Um, the NFV Open Platform is an example of this change in strategy that is the result of open source, and specifically the result of our work on OpenStack and our contribution there. It's taught us how to share again. If you look at how we, how we typically work, our vendor relationships are very much about a uh, very small number of vendor relationships because it is very onerous to create a relationship with AT&T. Uh, many of those relationships have lasted over 100 years, and those are very large. And it takes uh, quite a bit of effort legal-wise and uh, uh, negotiation-wise to get those in place. When you look at the 400 companies involved in OpenStack, it would take us to 2112 to be able to make agreements with that many companies. OpenStack has provided a proxy for us to get innovation into AT&T that's, that's very unique. So this is a concept that, um, that I, I feel very strongly about. It creates an ecosystem that we can work with and get help from, from a lot of different groups. Our contributions have not always been that great in this space. It's growing, but our indirectly with our partners we have made a lot of contributions, and you'll see that with what we're talking about today. OpenStack, uh, we've been using it, you know, we've had it in our lab since uh, 2010. I was at the very first summit. It's real remarkable, the growth that's happened here. I remember being in a one-room summit uh, with, a, with not very many people. And then now, it's honestly very daunting to be talking to thousands of people in one room. The change for us, as uh, we, we started using it in 2010, in production, we, we actually put production workloads in two, end of 2011. We today run a number of websites like itcanwait.com, something I highly recommend you go to pledge, uh, at ts developer programs uh, around its API exposure, our mHealth program, our toggle, our dual persona work, uh, the back ends for our address book that's on everyone's phone. These things are just the first steps that we've taken into deploying applications onto OpenStack. Today, it's about 120 applications. Now, we've lived through good times and bad times with, with OpenStack. Obviously, for us, we actually still have pre-Diablo versions, Cactus versions of in production, uh, which is somewhat problematic and an issue that 
I know the community is working on. I'm very excited about in Ice House the, the work done to get to rolling up grades and the promotion of CI, CD, and these types of things in, in OpenStack. This is, is very helpful to us. Now, as we've gone forward, we've expanded our footprint. So it started with three, three data centers, and now we've, we've deployed it into seven data centers uh, today. Uh, at this end of the year, we should, have, we should add three more. It's the use cases that we're using have expanded from typical back-end applications and some of our external services, our API gateways. They've expanded now to include new things, especially big data and, and, and then a whole new area of function uh, that, that I'm very excited about. It keeps me uh, coming to work really pumped about the, the opportunity. Uh, over the next period of time, over the next two years, we actually plan to expand the footprint from seven uh, to ten sites and expand that by ten to twenty sites. You, ask, you might ask, why so many locations? The answer is NFV, or Network Function Virtualization. So Network Function Virtualization, I hate to be a purveyor of yet another acronym. AT&T is an acronym, and it's really excited about its acronyms. Uh, and it, Feel free to throw something at me if I reel off 12 in one sentence. It's very possible when we talk about the, the mobility systems that we work on. But NFV is, is making a significant uh, change in our industry. It's causing galaxies to collide. The traditional IT space and the traditional telco space of function and uh, competitors and vendors, they're colliding. They're colliding on top of a concept that is essentially the ongoing onslaught of Moore's Law, of automation, of agile methods, of consolidation, commoditization, these web scale. These concepts are now catching the systems that we run inside of our, our network, the things that we use to run our mobility systems and the things that we use to run our TV platforms. They're all getting caught up in the same desire, desire to be more agile, to move faster, to, to, be, uh, to have higher utilization, to lower the cost, to move faster, to, to be, have bring function to market quicker. It's, those things are getting wrapped up in it. We, even AT&T, is having competition in, from unique new, part, new players. And we have to move faster, we have to change. OpenStack, open source is helping us to do that because I believe that OpenStack can expand to include workloads like NFV. So again, this, this concept of NFV is really changing the, the landscape. Today in our networks, we run a number of things that are built on very specific hardware. Things that you may be familiar with, routers and switches, firewalls, load balancing, all things that have been traditionally things that have been already running on OpenStack today, uh, already part of the SDN phenomena. And then beyond that, we are talking about elements of the mobility system, things like session border controllers or, or NAT, huge NAT devices. They're, they really are uh, custom built, very expensive pieces of hardware. But when you look at them, they're actually very similar to the other things that we run. They look very similar to load balancers and firewalls and, and application servers. They, and it, thankfully, they come to us with the natural pre, pre dereliction toward scale out, toward uh, cattle based architectures. So, in a way, they're ready. They're ready to make this transformation. And if you look at this space, you see a lot of open source players that are coming to, to, to actually solve this problem, starting with. Uh, the things like Asterix and such, starting at that point, those are expanding to include many of these network functions, both on the mobility side and on the TV side, as we look at uh, and then are inspired by what Netflix has been able to do on a public cloud in a very scale-out model. We are able to be inspired to, to change the way that we, we deliver TV content to our, to our U-verse customers. So this, this is helping us in a number of ways. Obviously, it is by changing to a new model, 
taking everything that was running in specialized hardware and moving it into a virtualized world, either uh, VMs or uh, containers or even uh, virtual appliances, bringing them into a multi-tenant space allows us to get higher utilization, uh, more agility, and uh, allows us to be more competitive and allows us to distribute function closer to the user. The real advantage that AT&T has, and if you think about it, we have an enormous number of physical places around North America where you could put servers. And by doing so, and, and having a lot of underutilized bandwidth between all these locations, if you think about it, we can take uh, like content distribution to the next level, make it far more dynamic, and have it exist closer to the user. This is essential to things like moving a mobility system into, our, into a virtual platform, take, making OpenStack handle more distributed methods is a key part of making this transition happen. So to me, OpenStack is well positioned to handle this, this uh, new workload. The things about OpenStack that, that I like, beyond what I was describing as a proxy for working with a, a much richer ecosystem, a pluggability model. This pluggability model in like Cinder and in, and in Neutron helps us to get leverage over vendors and to work with a broader set of vendors. And within that model, there is enormous peer pressure between vendors to have uh, high quality code, testable code, stuff that actually that works uh, and, is, and is scalable and performant. Beyond that, OpenStack and its, uh, its innovation cycle, it's helping us to promote the use of agile methods within AT&T. It's an example of how continuous integration, continuous deployment, and these types of, of things, especially our work around Tempest and around uh, RefStack and DefCore and these things, they're helping us to promote Agile within AT&T, a place that uh, pretty much invented the waterfall method. Now, this uh, innovation is causing us to really question not just within this space, but in other spaces as well. SDN is a particular example where um, we're, we're now realizing that the routers and switches that we use, they, they need to be virtualized as well. Unfortunately, the SDN term is very overloaded. And when I first heard NFV, I thought, do we really need to have another term since SDN is already so overloaded with uh, hardware, software disaggregation, control plane, data plane uh, separation, and uh, hypervisor uh, vir switch virtual vir v-switch virtualization and overlay protocols and uh, orchestration and automation. Why do we need to have, why not just add in the, the layer four plus functions and the things that telcos think of as network uh, app, really applications? Why not just call that all SDN? Unfortunately, my coworkers are the ones that came up with NFV concepts. So eventually I have to, I have to kind of comply with this, this idea. And in some sense, it makes sense because NFV means uh, uh, really, a different kind of application footprint, a different kind of uh, function. So hopefully, and you know, when I look at all of the benefits of OpenStack and where, where it's been and where it's gone and, and the next nine releases, as Mark was talking about, I'm very excited about it, the opportunity. It's, it is awesome. Now, the thing is, and this reminds me of when I was a kid, I had this uh, bike. It was called the Raleigh Chopper Mark II. It was, it had a small wheel in the front, a large wheel in the back, very large tires. It had a banana seat with all leather with a nice back. It had a sissy bar, and um, it had uh, shock absorbers. It had a, like a muscle car shifter and, uh, with three speeds. It had ape hangers. It was awesome. It was red. Unfortunately, it suffered from two fatal flaws. One, that the shifter was not really in a very strategic location. And when you were going, more, more onerous was when you were going downhill at high speed and you applied the brake pressure equally, you had a tendency to reverse wheelie and fly out the front of the bike. Uh, in this process, I lost a tooth, uh, a cleft chin, part of my face, and uh, mysteriously, at the, after the second time, the bike itself disappeared. 
don't let OpenStack have, have this kind of fatal flaw. People say, you know, the OpenStack is fatal flaws that it doesn't have a benevolent dictator. Or people who say that don't understand the model. The PTLs, the projects, they are essentially separate open source projects that have a unique federation, a unique uh, binding cohesion that is the overarching concept of OpenStack that makes it work. That isn't its fatal flaw. This fatal flaw is not scaling from the level we're at now to the next level. I am confident in the model, I'm confident in the people, and I'm confident in the adoption that's happened. For me, the, the fatal flaw is a lack of, you know, expanding the paradigm, thinking about OpenStack more broadly. You know, not every workload is a, is a perfect scale-out cattle application. Every once in a while, one of those cows look like Bessie, and you kind of fall in love with it. Uh, and unfortunately, that can give you a black eye. The pets have to be handled and have to be managed. The enterprise workloads, I feel, have to be brought into scope more, more clearly. And then on the other side, when we talk about catering to telco workloads, reliability, performance, scalability, distribution to many locations has to be a part of the story. It has to be included into uh, what we're thinking about. And it, in the end, I think OpenStack can handle that, and it can expand to this scope. So hopefully, uh, if you'd like to hear more detail, more specific technical detail about what the change is and specifics about NFV and SDN, and then uh, some of the work that we're doing blueprint-wise and changes we're trying to get uh, promoted uh, into OpenStack to make, make it more uh, usable for this new NFV workload, please come and, and hear Mats Carlson at Ericsson and I talk about, uh, about this at 250. Thank you.